this is gonna go out. Yes, at the end of three days of yelling. All right, so we're almost to the end of the first day of the conference. Yes. Yeah, so far it's been an awesome day, if I don't say so myself. Um, of course, after Jonathan Blow and Mark Ken Bosch give their talk, Miraculously, all the games, all the finals games are gonna be playable. The galleries are all gonna be open. So everybody should head out from here, back over to the fire station, to uh, Fleischmann, to wherever all the games are. Um, and I think they're open till eight tonight. Is that correct? Yes. Where are they? I just said that, Eric. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> they are in the fire station, Fleischmann Gallery, and I think over in the Indicate Village, and I believe that's all the locations. So anyway, I'm gonna be quiet, and I'm gonna hand things over to these guys. Take it away. Hopefully these work. Is this on? Can yeah, this yes. Great. This will be awkward while I take videos behind myself. All right, so you guys, uh, many of you have probably played Portal 2. Uh, this is a game where you can create doorways between points in space called portals. And this is a level where this new uh, game mechanic called a light bridge is introduced. And as you create portals, the bridge will flow from its starting point through the portal and you can walk on it. <clears throat> now here, I wanna get into this very dark and mysterious space over here, but how do I do that? I can't walk there. Well, I know that if I shoot a light bridge out from this wall over here, this conveniently placed white colored wall, uh, the, the bridge will extend into that area and I can go explore that, right? Um, there's a problem though, I only have two portals and they're both being used to get the bridge to where I am now. If this orange portal were to disappear, I would fall to my death. Uh, however, being a uh, good puzzle solving kind of player, I realized that if I open the orange portal down there on the left so that it runs below where I'm standing, then as the current light bridge disappears, I will land on the new one. And then I can go explore, right? And now that I understand this principle, I can do this again and again with good results. All right, hopefully many of you have played this game, VVV, VVV. This is a game where your guy can't really jump, but he can reverse the direction of gravity that affects him. He can jump over spiked pits, navigate trickier areas, and at some point in the game, you come across these horizontal lines that bounce you back the way that you came, right? Normally, you can't flip your gravity direction unless you're standing on a solid surface. So when you kind of do your flip jump, you've committed yourself. But these suddenly change the rules of the game. Now at some point in space, as you're flying through the air, you will flip. And so you can go and do slightly uh, treacherous, precarious things uh, with your new understanding of this. And then, at some point, you start to see interesting higher level constructs get built. Uh, this is a situation where I'm standing on the bottom of this platform and I can actually fly through the air 180 degrees around and stand on the top of the platform. And the way that I do that would be unintuitive if you didn't understand how these work, right? There's this spiky pit of death below, and I'm about to uh, fling myself toward it uh, to certain death, except I'm gonna air control myself across this line, and as soon as I cross that line, I'm gonna flip and then fly toward those spikes also to die, but then I air control myself in the other direction, I'll cross that line again and land safely on the other side of the ledge, right? So this is like some kind of interesting higher level primitive or higher level situation. Now this is an even higher level one uh, where I've sort of built, or, or I haven't, but the, the game designer has built a, uh, Kerry Kavanaugh, has built a higher level, uh, more complicated construct out of three of these lines and it's a little neater, right? You zip up, you bounce, you go all the way around. So that's cool. Um, these, uh, I am here to tell you, are little nuggets of truth that the designers of these games have packaged for the player. 
Now, I am calling them truth, uh, even though these are things that you are experiencing as a player as pieces of some kind of fictional game world that doesn't really exist. But if you think carefully about these kinds of things, they are about subjects that pertain to the real world that we live in, to our universe, or even to the abstract universes that people like mathematicians explore, right? That thing that happened in Portal where I dropped from one light bridge to another has something to do with lines intersecting in, in 3D space, at least intersecting in two dimensions, but one being below another one in a third, right? That's a relatively sophisticated thing to understand, and yet in gameplay it happens very naturally, right? The thing in VVVVVV was more, uh, more abstract, right? You start to build these higher level constructs out of a primitive, and you don't exactly know what that corresponds to in your real world experience, but it is a lot like the kinds of things that abstract mathematicians do. They build these constructs out of what-if questions and then ask what the consequences are. So what we're here to do today is present to you an aesthetic of game design that is built around this process. You mine nuggets of truth and you package that truth for the player. So, um, is this working? <laughs> no. On. One of them doesn't work. Oh, all right. I'll take this one. Hello. Yes? Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So when we look at the universe using mathematics, we see a system. Um, and mathematics is surprisingly powerful at helping us understanding the, the way the universe functions, right? This, this, the universe has a system. Uh, so for example, why can math, one mathematical concept apply to so many situations in physics? Or uh, why is simple math so effective at modeling complex phenomena? And it's so powerful, in fact, that some physicists believe that mathematics and the universe are intricately, intricately linked together at the very low level, right? And it's a deep question uh, at, outside of the scope of this talk, but um, what some, so basically, uh, another way to look at the universe is uh, to use games because they are toy universes in a way, right? And they're also complex mathematical systems, just like the, uh, when you analyze the, you know, a physical system, you also have a complex mathematical system, right? And uh, why are they complex math? Why are games complex mathematical systems? Well, you know, you just start with some game state and there's some rules that evolve the game state and that also involve input from the player and then you keep evolving that state until the player just decides to stop playing. Uh, so mathematics has the same property of, uh, you know, starting with some objects and I mean it has the same property of, it can, it can be used to model physical phenomena but it can also stand on its own as sort of a field uh, that does not uh, care about the real world, right? You can just start with some mathematical objects that we don't know, um, that have no equivalent that we know of and uh, in the real world. And we can work with these objects and, uh, you, know, you know, apply some rules uh, and then eventually prove some theorems about them, or prove some facts about them. And, uh, the interesting thing about that is that mathematicians, when they look at you know, equations or systems, uh, they talk about beauty. And they seem to agree that the shortest theorems that carry the deepest consequences are the most beautiful. And uh, because we sort of uh, you know, connected games and mathematics in this, uh, in this way, uh, we can think of applying the same principles of beauty to uh, games as well. And that's the core of the aesthetics that we are presenting today. Um, so now, does this one work? Are we good? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so, you know, when we're implementing a video game, uh, we build a system. And in this aesthetic, we're saying that we're going to build those systems in order to explore their consequences in a math-like way. And I do want to say math is a loaded word for many people, right? Because we go to school, we get this kind of mindless arithmetic drilled into our heads, but that's not really what we're talking about when we say mathematics. We're referring rather to the kind of um, thoughtful exploration of the unknown that a professional mathematician or you know, an academic mathematician would pursue. 
And now, as designers, we sort of go out on the avant-garde and dig through all these results and find the ones that we want to present to players so that they can have a sublime experience when they play our games. <clears throat> and th that's kind of a grand goal, so how do we do that? Well, as with anything, you've got to start with an idea. Um, it can actually be a very simple idea. It could be a game mechanic, like, hey, my guy's got a grappling hook, and he, he's a guy in a platformer, and he can shoot the hook to a platform that's far away and drag himself there, right? That's a very concrete idea that you could sit down and implement right away. But it could actually be something much vaguer. It could be uh, a detail of the game that you want to make happen, but you don't know what the framework around it would be. And that might be something like, you know, I'm making a puzzle game. I know I want it to be a puzzle game, but I don't know the gameplay mechanic. I don't know what actions the player performs to solve puzzles yet, uh, but I do know I, I want it to be, uh, have this certain feeling, and I want there to be some puzzle where the player has to hear a melody somewhere and go somewhere else and remember that melody to solve the puzzle, but as to what actions he performs to show that he remembers the melody, I don't exactly know. Anything like that is a suitable starting point for what we're talking about, and we'll show how we did that for our particular games. Now, when you're exploring, here's sort of a summary of how you want to do it, and we're going to go through this bit by bit in greater detail, but uh, what we're talking about is aiming toward the richest space that you can find. When you get there, you want to explore it completely, and once you've explored, you want to trace a strong boundary around what you've found. Um, once you've got those results, you want to present them cleanly, and then you want to look over what you've done and ensure that you're doing it with the lightest contrivance, because the less contrivance you have, the closer to the truth you will get, and that is something we'll look at very carefully. All right, so um, how did that start in, in Migakure, which is my game? Uh, so I knew that I wanted the game to be uh, four-dimensional, right? Uh, and I wanted the rules to be as simple as I can possibly make them. So there are four dimensions total, right? Uh, and But humans can only see or move in three dimensions, obviously, right? So one possible way of setting that up is having uh, a button that you press and swaps out one of your dimensions with the fourth one. And so I knew, uh, I had this idea for a mechanic, but, uh, and I also had read, you know, Flatland and books about the fourth dimension, and I knew that walking through a wall, or actually like jumping over the wall using the fourth dimension, uh, was a consequence of, um, being able to move in four-dimensional space. So that seemed like a nice check that the mechanic was going to be uh, good enough. If that action, that seems pretty simple, is actually simple in the game, then that means that's a good mechanic, right? So I, I, I tried to imagine it in my head what would happen, um, and it seemed like it was going to work, so I had to try it in code, and it did work, and this is what happened. Oh, it's playing underneath. Go Windows. <laughs> okay, wait. Play again. Yeah. All right. So you start out, and you want to get to the other side of the wall, but you can't because the jump, the the, the wall is too high, so you can't jump over it. But one thing you can do is swap dimensions, so that now you can move to a parallel universe. And in that parallel universe, this one, there is no wall, uh, but there's just a shadow of it. So in that universe, you can walk through the wall, you can walk past the wall, and because the universes are connected in this weird way because of the fourth dimension, when you switch back and go back to your other universe, you're, back, you're on the other side of the wall, right? So that action sort of felt like natural, and it was um, at that point that Your slide At this point, the I had the mechanic, um, and I had some sort of way of editing levels. So, so I, I tried experimenting, right? I tried putting some blocks at different locations and seeing what would happen. And one other thing that happened is that you can, uh, even though there's nothing for you to climb on to get to the wall, you can uh, you can put that thing in another universe and then use that to w 
jump onto the wall. And so it feels like you just appeared onto the wall like out of nowhere, and there was no way for you to do that. Um, but, uh, and so that's a consequence that's interesting because books about the fourth dimension don't talk about stuff like that, right? Um, and so that was the, the beginning of like developing uh, the game. Yeah, so those were the things Mark was thinking about as he started uh, Miyagakure. Um, this is what I was thinking about when I started my new game, The Witness. Um, I knew that I wanted it to be, you know, this sort of lush world where you can wander around at will um, and see all kinds of interesting things, but when you came upon a puzzle, you knew instantly that it was a puzzle, even if you had no idea how to solve it. And the way that I decided to indicate that would, was that there would be these little touch screens uh, in, in the world, sort of like an iPad mounted somewhere. Um, and I knew I wanted you to draw some line or curve on the touch screens, and if you drew the right pattern, because I had in my mind that this was a game about patterns, then you would successfully open the door or you know, activate some machine or something like that. But that's really all that I knew in that uh, department. Uh, I didn't know the details. And so one question that I asked myself you know, to start, even because I'm a programmer as well as a designer, like what do I start typing in? Uh, do I let people draw in a free form way or do I have some kind of more constrained way, right? Where you can only draw in certain directions. And I decided very quickly, it can't be free form because you're gonna get something really ugly like that, right? And it's gonna be different if you use a mouse or a trackpad or a joystick um, or an iPad. You know, you're gonna suddenly, how hard it is to register your solution of the puzzle is gonna vary drastically based on the platform. So I said, well, that's not a good idea. Um, it's not gonna feel good. So I'm gonna have some kind of grid uh, system where there are some markings and they're like grooves where you can only draw in the grooves. Um, so that was a very early decision, but that doesn't pin down very much and there's still a lot of things to think about. Um, so uh, one question, you know, I decided there's gonna be a very clear place where you start and I've marked this with this very fat starting point. Um, but then where do you end? One idea might be you just trace a line to the appropriate grid position that signals an ending uh, and whatever shape that you drew um, will determine if you got the solution. Right, so here I am starting to do that. Um, and I've made the center square the solution, and so it kind of blinked a second to call to me. But because it's inside the grid, right, I have trouble, it's not satisfying to get there because you can easily slip past it, right? I'm constrained, but I can still go north, south, east, west. And so it's like, uh. So here, I've added a little endpoint, like a cul-de-sac at the end, where I can slot directly in there. And like, boom, I, I know I'm at the endpoint, I haven't slipped past it. So now, once that decision is made, still lots of things to decide. Like, does, does this line have the ability to cross itself, right? Or is it more solid? Can it run into itself? And what are the consequences of each of those things? So here's what it sort of feels like. I can cross through myself, and I can go around, and I can even just trace over myself. Now I'm circling this block multiple times, and it's like, geez, does it matter that I circled that multiple times? Is that different than just going around it one time, right? And if it is, then don't I need to figure out a way to visually register that difference? Because what you saw there, you couldn't tell how many times I'd circled that block. And so early on thinking about this, I was like, that's a big mess. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't please me, right, aesthetically. So I'm gonna go this way. Uh, it's gonna be a solid line. It bumps into itself. You can't ever cross yourself. Um, you know, not at corners, not at long edges or anything. Um, you trace to the end and you solve. And, uh, That was a very fortunate decision um, that I found that early, but I would have done it eventually. Um, there, there are a lot of reasons that it's interesting besides just the game feel reasons that I started with. Uh, most notably that if you can just draw over your own line willy-nilly, then what you do when you start doesn't change what you're able to do as you come toward the exit, right? Uh, because you can go anywhere all the time. It doesn't constrain you. But in the version where you collide with yourself, once you start going through this maze, it's almost like you're marking out territory. Like you can't actually come back and go this way because it's blocked. Uh, so that led by itself, before I even know what the puzzles are, to a lot of interesting mechanics because I did something that had this possibility of complexification, of combining with other things. 
So now, there's a lot of different ways to go, right? This is a four by four grid of squares. Uh, and if I just want to go from the lower le left to the upper right, there's a lot of things that happen. And I haven't decided yet what is the right answer, but there are already properties that I can observe of the family of all things that could be the right answer, right? Um, I can't cross myself, and I'm going to go from the lower left to the upper right. Well, uh, I'm generally partitioning this space, right? So now there's some squares on one side of the line, there's some squares on the other side of the line. Maybe I do it that way so that there's fewer squares on the upper left. Maybe I do it that way so that there's more squares on the upper left, right? Um, and so very early I'm exploring, and wow, you really can't see. There's a grid here, but these colors are very close together. Um, so already I'm just exploring about these very fundamental things, and this idea that now there are cells on each side of the line led to this puzzle type that's about uh, correctly uh, drawing a partition between uh, some object types and other object types. And that came just by asking these low-level questions. It didn't come from a top-down imposition, I want to make a puzzle type that, blah. Rather, it came from this very simple process of exploration very early in development. Now, this kind of exploration is going to yield a lot of possibilities. And at the very beginning, when we uh, haven't quite yet decided what our game's about, maybe we don't know. Maybe we want to explore a lot of possibilities uh, to figure out what the game's about. Later on, though, um, as we kind of know what the game is, uh, we really have to start making decisions uh, with, without implementing things. Because if you implement everything, you'll run out of development time, right? You'll die before you get your game done. Um, so how do you decide what you like? And in terms of the aesthetic that we're presenting to you today, we have some criteria that we use uh, that we consider virtuous if you can uh, embody these characteristics in the design of your game. Here's a list of what they are. We're going to go through them one by one. Uh, but the overall goal, really, uh, is to show a lot of truth as much as you can with minimum contrivance. So starting this, this uh this, this process, um, you want to aim for the richest space, right? You want the most interesting consequences you can get. Uh, you want as many uh, as possible. And uh, you can adjust your mechanics to get different consequences and uh, sort of slowly iterate towards a state where um, you get more, most consequences. And, and during that iteration, your main mechanic might change a lot, right? Uh, and then after a while, maybe you'll stabilize, and then your sub-mechanics will, uh, will change, and they will stabilize, and then eventually you'll get a full game, right? Um, so, for example, when I started making my game, I didn't, uh, I hadn't read Flatland at that point, right? And so I didn't know about the wall consequence, and just by, uh, just with that, like just trying to come up with interesting consequences of being in a move in four-dimensional space, if there's no terrain, then you don't get that many interesting consequences, right? It's really hard to get something interesting. So just by adding that, I had this huge space and it was easy to, to, to move forward from there. Once you've found a space that's rich uh, with potential consequences that you want to explore, you want to make sure that you don't waste the space, right? You want to uh, make good use of what's there and be complete in your exploration, right? Um, are there major consequences of your game mechanics or of the basic ideas that you didn't hit, that you left lying there on the ground? Um, if that's true, then your game may feel incomplete. And so I'm going to use an example uh, from my previous game, Braid, to illustrate this. This is a 2D platformer uh, where your basic uh, operation, besides running and jumping, uh, is to control the flow of time. So at any point, you can rewind time and, and everything will go backwards, right? Uh, and then there's a, that's the main mechanic, I would say, for the purposes of this talk. And there's a sub-mechanic introduced pretty early on, which is that some objects in the world are immune to your ability to rewind time. So in this picture, uh, maybe hard to see in the back, but this lever and this movable platform down here are both immune to time. So no matter what I do, no matter how many times I press the rewind button, those guys are always moving forward in time, and that by itself creates interesting situations, which I won't go into here. Um, now, a game like this has a relatively small number of basic object types, right? There's your character, there's monsters, there's keys and doors and movable platforms and levers, and you could go down the list, but ultimately it's not really that many. So for the purposes of this completeness criterion that I'm talking about today, if you ask a question like, what happens if some things 
are immune to your ability to rewind time. That is an incomplete question unless you apply it to every kind of thing that you know about in your world. What happens if uh, you know, the player character is immune to being rewound? What happens if a monster is immune to being rewound, etc.? And that can actually work its way into relatively uh, complex situations. So here, it's un under again. That's great. So here's a puzzling braid. Um, I need to unlock these two gates over here to my right. This is my character. There's a key on the left that I need to get to open those gates, but it is the only key. And there are two gates. And uh, as via classic video game rules, once I unlock a gate, that key is destroyed and I can't use it again. So what do I do? Well, the idea behind this puzzle was what happens if a gate is immune to being rewound, but a key is not? So now we're talking about applying this to two different object types, right? One in the positive, one in the negative, right? What happens if this type of object has this type of criterion attached to it? Now, I care about completeness a lot when I design my own games, and I will take it uh, past the point where some people think it's a good idea, uh, but I think it's a very good idea, right? So, you know, some people say, well, the point when I'm designing my game is to make it the most fun game. Um, I don't agree with that for my own personal design decisions, right? Uh, I'm, I'm aiming at something subtler and, and harder to talk about, and I will get rid of fun if it means that I can get at something deeper or more complete. So here's an example of Braid where I did exactly that. There are a bunch of places in the game where I did exactly that, but this is, if I can find my mouse cursor. All right. So this is world four of Braid, which is uh, another sub-mechanic is introduced where time moves forward as you go to the right and backward as you go to the left. If you move vertically, time stays still. And this creates interesting situations right away to explore with weird behavior that's all attached to every intimate movement of your character. But then after we've uh, started exploring that, we can ask very specific questions, right? Now, many people don't notice this when they're playing. It's a relatively subtle thing. But all through World 4, in every level before this one, this is the last one in that world, every level before this one, any time you pick up a key, it is glowing green. It is exempt from your ability to rewind it. And the reason why they're always glowing green is so that they conform to standard platformer mechanics. If you pick up a key in a platformer, you want to be able to run right with it, you want to be able to run left with it and just have it work. And especially as the player is new in this world and they're first learning the rules, if you throw something really crazy at them, they're not going to get it. It's going to affect their ability to learn. However, if you hold that crazy thing back, even if it's interesting, and never put it in, then the game feels incomplete. So there's a question, what happens if I'm in world four and have a key that is not immune to being rewound? Well, what happens is when you go to the right, everything is as normal. When I go to the left, though, I'm rewinding time. Notice the key isn't really in my hand anymore. What it's actually doing is retracing the steps that I did when I went to the right. It's kind of floating in the air, jogging on its own like a jolly old key. Um, so now I'm going to go back. I, I, I climb up. Nothing bad happens when I climb up. But as soon as I go left, the key's rewinding again. And now it's retracing its steps down at the bottom. But then I go right. Time's going forward, which means object simulates. So the key just falls to the ground lifeless, right? So all of these things are things that make sense given the core statements of what the game mechanics are. Um, but they're very difficult to figure out for a player, right? But to me, uh, that is an interesting sign of depth or of um, intricate detail for players who are interested in figuring out that kind of intricate detail. Now, another thing that's very valuable is, in games is surprise. And this is sort of really part of what's at the heart of what we're talking about today. Um, anyone who knows about data compression knows that surprise is sort of the same thing as the information content of a message, right? If you send somebody a message, uh, and the message only says exactly uh, everything that they expected to get from you, then there's no information in that message, 
right? So in some sense, having a very surprising game is about maximizing the amount of information uh, contained within this limited package. Uh, now, what's interesting about surprise is that the, the quest for surprise, the desire to make the game surprising, is a counterbalancing force to this desire to make the game complete. If you want to make your game complete, you're going to be like, oh, I want to make every single object type interact with every single other one and illustrate all of those things in the game design. And in the process of doing that, well, this thing is kind of boring. That thing, the player would have been able to predict this thing over here, but I've got to put it in anyway to be complete. And what Surprise says is, no, after you do all that stuff, after you're complete, you then go through and be an editor, right? And take out all the things that are not surprising, except possibly for things that you need to tutorialize people up on the game. But even then, you want to minimize that if it's not surprising, right? There are a bunch of techniques for generating surprise. Um, one easy one is just to have your game mechanics combine with each other, which we're already uh, saying is a good idea. But again, here, uh, this level that I showed you the video of has pretty much three game mechanics being combined, right? One of them is guy opens the door with a key. Uh, one of them is uh, a ability to rewind, and one of them is some things are immune to rewind, right? Now, a player is very good at predicting what will happen for any one of those things by itself. After I've opened some doors with keys, I don't even need to do it anymore to solve a level. I can look at the level as soon as I come in and say, there's a key there, there's a door there, there's a door there, there's a key there, there's a door there, solved, right? Um, my brain is very good at that, right? Um, rewind is a little weirder, but after the player is used to it, they can predict that pretty well. But what happens when you combine all of these things together is they start twisting around each other and you get something a little bit, uh, the product of a little bit of chaos, right? That's more than the sum of its parts. Um, another way to surprise is to build uh, high level expressions from your lower level concepts. And here is again another example from VVVVVV, which I really like a lot. Um, So, this is sort of one of the most famous situations in this game. Uh, this is my guy. Recall that he cannot jump. Uh, there's a collectible right here that he really wants to get. It's very valuable. All he has to do to get this collectible is to go over this tiny, tiny square, right? But he can't jump. So the only way he can do that is to fling himself off into space, get to a, a platform uh, that's above him, and then bounce back off it to come down. But when you try to do this as a player, here's what happens. Uh, you end up in this horrible maze of deathly spikes that are everywhere, right? Um, this is really funny. It's, it's a funny joke in the game, right? <laughs> Even though it's really painful to try and play. Um, but I think that part of the reason why it's funny is because it's true, especially in the sense of truth that we're talking about today. By the time you get here, you've played the game for a while, and you're comfortable with the basic movement of your character, right? You, you feel like the flipping upside down is kind of natural, the walking on the ceiling is kind of natural by now. And you might have thought a little bit like, yeah, something crazy could happen if I go off the screen to the top. Maybe that's happened a couple times. But most players will not have envisioned this scenario in their head, right? <laughs> um, and so when they get to it, it's a surprise, and it's funny, and it's kind of wonderful. Should I let him get there? <laughs> Yay. I've, not, I've never done that. I had to steal somebody else's YouTube video because I've never won that puzzle. Um, <clears throat> so we're sort of in the middle of these things that we think are virtuous now. Um, while we've, uh, so we've found a rich space of mechanics. Uh, we, we've uh, done a complete exploration. We've edited it to make sure it's surprising. Um, and now we want to make sure that we're very light in terms of contrivance. And what does that mean? Uh, anytime you're going to uh, declare a game mechanic, whether you're a programmer sitting down to type in code, maybe you're just a board game designer and you're just writing the rules on a piece of paper, right? There's an elegance to simple rules and there's an ugliness to complex rules. Now, often what happens in game design is we'll come up with a core rule or two that are generally in the neighborhood of what we want. And we'll see what happens. And often it'll be kind of what we want, but not really, right? Like, oh, I kind of like what happens here, but then in, 
when the game kind of comes to this sort of situation, I really don't like what's happening. So I'm going to edit the rule. I'm going to add a special case. I'm going to add five special cases. I'm going to saw off this half of the rule and glue on this half of this other rule, right? And very quickly, this thing that used to be elegant becomes kind of Frankensteinian in the quest to engineer certain very specific uh, end results in terms of the game design. And some uh, methods of game design are about doing that uh, very intensively, and that's fine. I'm not going to say it's terrible. Uh, from the point of view of this particular aesthetic, though, it's kind of bad. Um, because uh, you, lose, you lose that elegance, that elegance that points you at truth. Um, now, there's a proportionality at work here as well. That It's a subtle point, but I think it's very important to talk about. Um, say we're going to have two game mechanics, and I'm just going to call them A and B. And game mechanic A is pretty simple, and as a result of A, you get a good preponderance of pretty sophisticated, interesting, sublime results that happen in gameplay. And then you add another game mechanic B. We're only going to talk about the mechanics in isolation now, not how they interact. You add a new mechanic B, and as a result of adding B, Let's say B is twice as complicated as A, but you only get the same amount of results as A, right? Even though you would look at them both and say, hey, two game mechanics, they're each generating a lot of results, that's good. If B is twice as contrived as A, then relative to each other, B is gonna feel really ugly, right? If A was actually more contrived, then the game might feel a little bit more even, right? But the fact that there's this relatively elegant thing and then this really ugly thing next to each other, it makes the game design feel bad. Okay, so we found a lot of interesting space to explore. Um, we have explored it. Okay, yes. Um, we have explored it, okay. And then now we want to um, draw a boundary around it um, uh, to define our game, essentially, right? We want to give the game a focus. And uh, why, we, why we do that is because um, if the game is focused, it's easier to properly explore and also properly present it, right? Um, so even if mechanics have interesting consequences and work well with each other, we still might remove some mechanics. And there are a bunch of reasons why. Uh, one of them John talked about is if, if one mechanic does not provide enough surprise on its own, right, you might just remove that. Or if um, most of your mechanics are really um, rich, but then another one is relatively less rich than the others. Uh, you might just want to cut it out so that uh, the game is more focused. Uh, also, our definition of what the game is about might change as we make the game. So, uh, and then one of the mechanics might, not lo might no longer fit in that definition. So for example, in my game, it's a four-dimensional game. You'd think I might talk about time or explore how time works at all, but um, that was too much, and it's it's it you know it com complicates the games too the game too much. So I just stop at anything that is you know four spatial dimensions, and that's it, right? Uh, and also no magic, no, nothing like that's not mathematically sound, kind of. So uh, there are a bunch of other consequences, but I'll go into uh, other reason why you might remove a mechanic, but I'll go into them uh, now by defining compatibility of mechanics. And compatibility, compatibility of mechanics uh, is about, say you already have some mechanics, right? Uh, and you're thinking of adding a new one, right? Like you already have a game and uh, you, you, know, you like what's happening, there's nice truths there, but then uh, you're thinking maybe I should add, add a sidekick or something, right? The sidekick needs to interact with all of the mechanics that you already have, you know, for completeness. Um, and if you need to change mechanics in order for that to happen better, to reveal more interesting consequences, then uh, you should do that. But if you don't, then uh, it will feel incompatible, right? And so that mechanic will be incompatible and you should probably just remove it. Uh, and sort of the opposite problem of that is orthogonality of mechanics. Uh, it's when mechanics are too similar. So say you already have, again, you already have your, your set of mechanics, and you're thinking of adding a new one, but all the consequences that it adds are uh, already contained, you already had them in your game, mostly, right? So then why are you even adding that mechanic in, okay? So what is, uh, I use orthogonality here, but it actually has a real meaning uh, in, you know, in mathematics. 
and things like that. But what I mean is uh, you can do one thing uh, and at the same time do the other, and the first thing does not affect the, 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 the second. You can do them independently, right? And so, for example, I can move forward or I can move to the right, and I don't, you know, moving to the right does not cause me to move forward, or et cetera. And that, that's what, uh, you know, when we, uh, in math, we say directions are orthogonal, that's what, that's what it means, right? So, I think Ikaruga is like a very, you know, orthogonal, it has very orthogonal mechanics. So, in regular shoot them ups, uh, you usually have like a super bomb or something, right? And you use it uh, not as often as your main shot, but it's still used, you know, it's, it's really cool, it destroys a lot of stuff. Uh, but another use for that is to just, you know, you're in this desperate, desperate situation and you can just, uh, you know, throw the bomb and you know, uh, all the bullets will disappear. And it sort of saves you from desperate, desperate cases. But there's some unnecessary overlap because um, the, it's almost more useful to use the bomb as sort of this uh, last resort thing than to use it for, to destroy other enemies, right? So there's some unnecessary overlap between the two mechanics. And Ikaruga goes like completely past that because what they have is that your, sh your ship can be either one of two colors and the bullets are also uh, either one of two colors, right? It's like on the screenshot, it's like the red and the blue. And if you're the same colors as the bullets, then uh, you're immune to them. So if if you're in a you know in a difficult situation and the screen is filled with you know uh, blue bullets and you can just white bullets, you can just um, uh, switch to white because I mean if the screen is filled with black bullets, you can just switch to black and it will all the you'll be immune to those bullets and it will be uh, and you'll be safe, right? Um, so, so color sort of saves you in that, in that respect, but it has no overlap with shooting, right? It's a, it's a completely different thing. You can shoot and switch colors, and, it has, and they have nothing in common, right? Um, and so that's why it's very orthogonal, and I, I think that's like a, a, very, a very nice property that you want to have. And uh, also, no color is better than the other inherently. It depends on the situation, so that's even nicer, right? Um, and a consequence of all of sort of what I just talked about is generosity. So um, generosity is about uh, having mechanics that are not limited in, to the player. And why does that happen? Well, say you have two mechanics that overlap. Uh, in the case of Braid, you had um, checkpoints and you had the ability to rewind time. And both of those abilities were used if you were if you you know failed your jump or something, uh, you could either rewind time to get back onto the platform, or you could just you know you died and then you get back to the checkpoint and you know do it again. So those two mechanics really overlap. Uh, so let's say we remove one of them and we're going to remove checkpoints because rewinding time is much more interesting. So now we just have rewinding time. Uh, why should we limit it in any way, right? Um, we want to explore the consequences of rewinding time. So um, let's say the player has no, you know, no, uh, you know, sand that they collect in order to be able to use that mechanic. And that, you know, sort of all the, the things that we talked about sort of pushed us towards being more generous to the player. And for example, in my game, you can always go into the fourth dimension. There's nothing that limits you from, from, from doing that. And I think that makes it a better game. So that's our set of virtues. Uh, originous, completeness, surprise, light, contrivance, strength of boundary, compatibility, orthogonality, and generosity. Um, so now imagine we've sort of figured out what our game is generally. We know what the game mechanics are. We know what the player is doing from minute to minute. And we've strengthened that. We've sort of used these virtues. We've kept them in mind, and we've honed it. <clears throat> So now uh, we want to approach concrete situations. Like I'm sitting down to design a level, right? How do I make it good? Since uh, Mark and I have both been specializing in puzzle games, we're both working on puzzle games right now, uh, how do you design a good puzzle is something that people ask us once in a while. So we figured this would be a good way uh, to talk mainly about puzzles. However, sort of the techniques and the aesthetic we're talking about apply to all kinds of games, not just puzzles. Right, um, And what I have come to believe is that you don't make good puzzles by trying to make things that are hard. Um, 
You don't even make good puzzles by trying to make things that are good. This is paradoxical, right? But I think it's, it's how it is, right? What you do is you look for what's true about the situation. You use the puzzle to illustrate that truth. And the thing that you get as a result is pretty much inevitably going to be interesting. And we'll talk about why that is at the end. Now, key to this method is that the puzzle is not, like I said, it's not about being hard. It's also not about engineering some kind of arbitrary aha moment for the player, right? Aha moments are nice to have, but the reason that they're good in our eyes is because they let the player glimpse something, understand something that they didn't have before. Some piece of truth about the universe, right? Any aha moment that you engineer that doesn't do that is going to feel false and empty. So if you're going to do this well, and the point of the puzzle is to show something true, then you as a designer should really have a very clear picture of what that true thing is. You should understand it really well. Um, once you understand it and build a level around it that's got some monsters in it and some graphics and some sound effects or whatever, go through and eliminate anything that is not directly about that truth. You know, like when I was building Raid, I would have a level that was cool and then I'd, I'd have a few extra monsters in it and I'd be like, well, those guys can't just have one monster in a level, it's not challenging, right? Um, or, or if I only have one monster in the level, it's going to give away the puzzle, right? I need to have some more kind of his red herrings. No, the game got better and better the more of that stuff that I eliminated. Right, so for example, in the case of VVVV that we saw, um, there is one dead end, right? And it's cool because you're like, oh, that's interesting. There, there, there can be a dead end in that situation, and that's kind of funny in a way, it's surprising. Um, but what if in this situation there were like tons of dead ends everywhere, right? Like that would not add anything to, I think, this particular situation. So in that case, we want to remove some, that's what we mean by arbitrary, right? Like that's the kind of stuff that we remove to get closer to something that's like really just interesting and that's it. Um, so how do you make sure, like now we know what do we want the player uh, to know. So how do we make sure they get it, right? Um, the player has he has trying to solve this, trying to solve the puzzle, right? He's doing a bunch of attempts, and each attempt might be something like a random guess or like a more thought out uh, process. Um, but you don't want to brute force. You don't want to allow brute force uh, solutions to uh, to happen. You don't want the because you want the player to understand what the point of the puzzle is. And if he just did it by accident, then he doesn't get the point, right? So, but. But some puzzles are just so simple that you, there's no way that by removing everything, anything arbitrary, there's going to be still something interesting there, right? Uh, there's going to be a way of, I mean, there's going to be a way to make it uh, not brute forceable while still removing anything arbitrary. And for example, in the case of uh, the key and the, and the door in braid, um, it's okay that this puzzle can pretty much be figured out uh, uh, by accident because there be there'll be later puzzles that you know like talk about the same thing. Um, so information is being built up in the player's head as he's trying to figure out uh, what uh, what the solution to the puzzle is. Like he's you know each attempt sort of reveals something different, and the level of understanding is getting higher, right? And once that level of understanding is high enough, then the solution can be found. And that's really important because the space around the truth that you were trying to point out is also often more, even more valuable than the truth itself, right? Like you're trying to get, it's, it's not just this one point, it's this fuzzy region around, around the truth. So now we've just gone through a few slides telling you how important it is to make sure that the player understands something, but that's not actually true. Um, what you really want to do is make sure you have the capability to ensure that the player understands something and that for a certain amount of stuff in your game that that's true, right? But you want to make allowance for subtlety, at least I do, right? I want to be able to put things in the game that many people won't get, but that people who are extra attentive or extra interested in this kind of subject will get, right? Um, so, so it's like you want to you get to the point where you can do that 100% of the time. Everybody will understand everything that I want them to, and then go past that, and then be able to make some things subtle again. 
And now we've done a lot of like saying get the point and understand the puzzle and I think it's important to reemphasize uh, that this really is a different thing than puzzle games usually do, right? Usually puzzle games are trying to make you understand the solution to some arbitrary challenge and again, to just to hammer it home for the nth time, we're talking about things that aren't arbitrary. We're talking about things to understand because they are valuable in and of themselves outside the game. Now, another way to make puzzles extra interesting is to build a hierarchy of ideas out of them, right? We've already said that any individual puzzle should have a very strong idea behind it, but when you can make a sequence and there's a pattern along the sequence, the player can have a gradually dawning surprise or sort of sublime uh, growing of understanding of what this sequence is, right? So <clears throat> this actually happens naturally all the time. Uh, when you're first introducing your mechanic to a player, you give them some easy stuff, and then you give them some a little more involved stuff, and then a little more involved, and then gradually you build them up. And often that course of building them up is gonna be uh, a sequence. Like, here's something where you need to manipulate one crate to get up the cliff. Now you need three crates to, in a certain sequence, right? Um, but there are uh, other kinds of things you can do. So earlier I talked about uh, you know, this kind of puzzle in The Witness, which is about partitioning one space from another. Again, I apologize that the grid is kind of washed out, but it's there in every single one. Um, and this is actually also simultaneously a teaching training sequence, like I just mentioned, but it's also a conversation about other things that aren't quite as parallel. And I'll go through uh, what's going on here. <clears throat> the first one, the player doesn't even really know what these are about yet. Um, so I made it very simple. There's only four solutions to this and two are right. So you actually can get this one by brute forcing. But the reason is that, when, now remember the exits are these things that stick out over here. They're a little less clear with the thing that's washed out. But it's like, hey, did you realize that the winding you take around that shape matters? Because in this version, right, I've gone sort of clockwise around this group of white stones in here and then gone to the exit in the upper right. But now the exit is in, uh, in the left over here. And as I try to go around these stones the same way, I've blocked myself from the exit. Recall that the line can't cross over itself. <coughs> so now I'm like, huh, what do, I, what do I do? And it's not very hard. I figure out, oh, I can go this way, right? But that's a communication. It's a nonverbal communication. Pay attention to the way things wind and think about them, right? So here's one with two disjoint groups. And I threw in an empty square for good measure to sort of introduce that guy. Here again, we have another empty square in a different place. And because the exit's over here, it turns out the winding has to go in an opposite order. So it's like, hey, do you remember that? It was three puzzles ago. And then we come to this one, uh, which is often kind of a stumper. And, and here's why that happens. Uh, you start tracing it in this direction, and you very quickly block off the exit. And you say, well, that's not right. And so you try tracing it in the other direction, and you're like, oh, well, that's not right. Because I, I block it, I just block it a little later. But what do I do? And then it's like, oh yeah, I have to pay attention to the blank squares and cut through the middle. So there's some kind of conversation here about, you know, we've been showing you this roughly the same pattern of stones over and over, you know, with these groups of a certain shape. And now you have to break your perception of that pattern, right? It's different from training the mechanic. And that's interesting, right? Uh, it, it helps put that entire conversation uh, Allowing myself to talk in the puzzles about things that are not directly related to training the mechanic helps me build a superstructure that's very interesting around those puzzles. Right, so we've removed, we, um, part of the philosophy we've said you know, over and over is removing anything that is, feels arbitrary. And so that includes steps in uh, the puzzle solving, right? And so you'd hope that by removing arbitrary steps in solving a puzzle, uh, the number of steps becomes really small. And that's really good because then the execution of the puzzle is just um, much more straightforward. And it's just about understanding the space. It's not about uh, any, any execution at all. Uh, and so a good balance between low number of steps and making sure that the player can't brute force at all, which means that the chance of any, of the, any uh, particular solution, uh, any particular attempt at a solution being the right one is low, then you, you sort of have to balance those two, two forces out. And if you get it right, I think you get a better puzzle. So for example, in my game, there is a, um, a temple on the upper right. Um, and inside that temple, there is a block that you want to uh, step on to get to the gate that's too high for you to jump on. 
And because the building is closed, you can't uh, get the block outside of the temple unless you go into the fourth dimension and like grab it out of there uh, and sort of uh, uh, grab it and bring it back to your world, right? Um, and the, the, way, the, the way you do that is just by three steps, right? It's just like moving it, moving it a little bit and then it comes back to your world, right? But those three steps need to be really uh, understood in order to, to be done because the, the, the total number of steps, uh, of possible states that the level can be in is very large, right? Like the, the box can be anywhere in like four, dimension, four um, different parallel universes and a bunch of things like that. So you really need to know exactly what you want to do and do it, right? And I think like in that, in that case where the balance was like well done, then I think it, it, it made for a good puzzle. And so, uh, again, by removing anything arbitrary, we're sort of abdicating authorship over the puzzle, right? And so who, who is the designer of the puzzle? Well, I would say that the universe is the real designer of the puzzle, right? Um, and so um, when it, it makes the, the puzzles feel more fair when the player uh, you know, encounters them, because instead of feeling like you're trying to read the mind of the designer, you're just reading the mind of like Mother Nature or something like that, right? Um, right. This is actually a, <clears throat> sort of a relief to me as a designer, right? My picture of game design used to be, I have to work really hard and be a good game designer or else the game is going to suck, it's going to be unplayable, no, it won't be worth anything or whatever, right? And if you make a game just for fun, and, or, or to be fun, and it ends up not being very fun, you kind of lost, right? And especially if you make a game just to make money and it doesn't make any money, then you've really lost because usually those games aren't very interesting. Um, but if you make a game that, as we were talking about, encapsulates the truth in some way, then even if your other design skills are quite poor, right? You think that things should be understandable to the player and they're not. You think that things should be uh, playable, that they're not brutally hard and they're not. All these judgment calls that you make could all be wrong. But the game is still really worth something because that stuff is in there and some people are going to find it, right? So uh, this puts me at ease a little bit, right? It gives me uh, relief in my current design process. And so in closing, um, when we build games this way, we're sort of you know, pointing many lenses at the universe and trying to see what's out there. And I think that's you know, very valuable, just like another tool, just like mathematics. We can, uh, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a tool in our toolbox that we can use to understand the world better, right? Thank you. Thanks very much. Can, uh, let's take like 10 minutes of questions. The projector is needed elsewhere, so can I can totally. disconnect yeah. it? Whilst they're answering questions, and here's one right here. Yeah, I mean, question about Thanks. reducing complexity for your levels. I mentioned that if you remove the monsters, then it can change on better. Yeah. But under the tutorial, you have like plants Yeah, that, that, that's something that uh, you're going to say the plant doesn't need to be there, right? Well, it does. Well, I, I, so something, I felt something needs to be there, right? Like, there needed to be a separation between where the key is and where the door is, and like, space in a platformer isn't quite functional separation. You need to like, do something, right? And, and the reason it's a plant is because if you kill a monster, he's not separation anymore. Um, but I'm not, I'm not like super, uh, I don't know if that was the right decision in that case. Because I didn't have a clear picture of all these ideas back when I was designing a lot of the levels. But I wonder if it's not one part of your game, and there's a puzzle in your game. Yeah. It might be necessary for the last part, but not for the puzzle. Yeah, although I wasn't, um, I wasn't that much trying to make it be a good action platformer. Like, I was definitely like trying to tune the player movement and all that stuff to be really good, as you would. Like, you would sweat blood to make your platformer's player movement good. Um, but while I was developing it, uh, I was much more interested in the puzzle part than the platform part, and so I started to minimize all that. Ideally, I would have eliminated all the action parts so that the game had maximal accessibility, but the problem is just, in this framework of a game, you can't do, you're like trying to jump over monsters, it's timed, your grandma is gonna try to play it and she's not gonna be able to play it, right? So at some point, I was locked into the game I was making, and, and, and then 
but but given that that decision had been made, then this was the way it kind of eventually came out. What, like once you've got some action platforming, you kind of have to have it a little, right? Otherwise, eh. The other thing is, just to reduce your complexity, I think that you don't need generosity. I think it's really it's arbitrary. Like, it's, oh, I'm just going to create a constraint for it. It could be something that we just really like. And if you're, if you're not part of the conversation, please be quiet. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Other, other questions? Yeah. Um, regarding orthogonal game design. Sure. And, and you, you mentioned the example of the uh, bomb in, um, yeah. uh, in Schmuck games, uh, where it has the function of uh, eliminating uh, an enemy uh, or enemies uh, or getting you out of a tricky situation. Yeah. And you describe that as kind of a, um, an inelegance that it had this crossover, if I'm understanding you correctly. That the no, the crossover is between the f there's two uses for the bombs, right? One is killing things, and the other is getting out of tricky situation. And the, um, the overlap is between the killing things and your regular shot. So you want to remove that overlap, oh, but keep, okay. keep the other one, right? So you just want to get out of tricky situations, but you don't want that to be uninteresting in itself either, right? Oh, okay, I think that might make my question redundant. I think okay. I might have just misunderstood you. Yeah, yeah. So, skip it. Basically. That's cool. No other questions? Oh, back. Yeah. Uh, what are the projected release dates for the Victory and. When it's done. Yeah. <laughs> and, and on whatever platforms it gets done on. <laughs> uh, Chris? So, uh, Captain Daisy Door, um, you quoted Larry Wall's comment about you don't want a bottle of labor sign, you want to die. If you want to walk somewhere, you don't want to walk Manhattan, just and you want to walk straight there. So can you talk about, uh, so like the bomb, I love the idea, I mean, the first of the day, like the Yoruga bomb versus uh, color flip thing is a beautiful example of a functionality, but is it always desirable? If, if, you know, so the thing about a programming language is it's a tool to get stuff done, so you want to minimize it's like a different goal, right? You want to minimize the amount of time it takes to do anything or whatever, or robustness of the result. Although Perl is not exactly the best case, but <laughs> minimize the amount of time to get something done. Um, and uh, I mean, I, playing a game is not, if you want to minimize the amount of time playing a game, just shut it off, right? So it is, it is clearly a different goal. Um, I guess I mean, like, in, in interactions between things, so we talked at the rehearsal the other night, we talked yeah. about like, the way that the color change and the shot interact. Uh, in Ruga, because they're orthogonal in the game mechanics, and they interact inside the player, which is a great place to have things overlap and interact, right? As opposed to like, you know, okay. but is there anything? I mean, uh, 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 there's there's different kinds of art. There's like, you know, there's the really yeah. kind, and there's the kind of messy kind. Like, well, here's you, uh, so I, so I want to underscore this again. We sort of said this at the beginning, but what we're saying here, we're not giving you the only way to make a good game, right? We're identifying one particular aesthetic that we believe uh, results in a very nice kind of game that very few people actually make. Very few people do these things strictly. Um, I don't even do them as strictly as I would like to. Uh, however, there are some games that are very non-orthogonal that I think are really great. Like, I was a big Counter-Strike player for years, and all the guns in Counter-Strike are very non-orthogonal, right? They're different parameter tweaks of the same, de the same parameters. It's almost the definition of, uh, of non-orthogonality, right? But I really like that game. I think it's a really good game. Um, so, uh, different different things, right? We're just we're identifying like the space of what games could exist is really, 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 really huge, and we're kind of talking about a part of it, right? I don't know if you disagree with yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it's one of those things you got to know what the technology is, otherwise you're like heading different directions. Yeah, I mean, you might end up stumbling blind. Well, exactly. Or if I have to be exclusive, it just means that you can apply each one. What, what, we, what you could do is, yeah, is have one button that does both actions, but because the two actions are different, that would still be orthogonal. And that's, I mean, that creates an interesting space in itself. Like we were talking about how Explosion Man is doing that, right? Like it's one button for two actions, but the two actions have very different uses. Um, I don't know if you've played that or not. Basically, like you play, you press one button and you explode. 
um, and that kills enemies, but you can also jump using that. Well, you do also jump, it's the same action. Right, it's the same action, yes, that's what I meant. These are yeah. the, the flipping the gravity also makes you move. Like, it's not just a jump, which is kind of like, you know, it's, you know, Well, it's, it's a little less, because your gravity flip in that game doesn't affect anything else in the world, it only affects you, but, right. yeah. Other, yeah. Um, so I thought this was a really interesting talk about puzzle design, but it seems like you were you were acknowledging the fact that this talk doesn't necessarily apply to puzzle design, even all the examples you gave you were past puzzle design. So unless I'm misunderstanding something, um, how do you how do you see this applying outside the realm of puzzle design? Well, you know, my my next game, I, I don't I always have weird thoughts about what my next game is, but currently I'm thinking it might be a stealth game, right? Um, and stealth games tend to have a little bit in the way of puzzles, like how do I get that? guard to do this, but they, they're often more emergent, right? And so, um, I mean, explaining how you would apply this in concrete terms to that kind of game would take another lecture, right? But, um, I mean, I see how to do it. It's just we don't, we don't have time and it's, it's a hot room and people are tired, right? <laughs> um, but I, I believe if you sit down and think about it, like if you go through the list of, of criteria or virtues that we listed and you think, how would I do that? with a racing game, you could probably find answers. Like for example, Ikaruga, it's a shmup, right? That's not a puzzle game, really. It's got some puzzles in it, but it's not a puzzle game for the most part. Uh, but it's got that orthogonality of, of action like we're talking about, right? And, and it's got some surprise and, and a variety of things, so. We, just, we, we did, though, while we had the opportunity to focus on puzzles, because one thing that happens when people give a talk like this is people say, well, you said a bunch of general things, but I don't know how to apply them. So we wanted to get a little more specific, and focusing on that genre helped us be more specific. I mean, it's easy to say, oh, you should just make your games good. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who really wants to ask a question that hasn't? Nobody. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess the video is, right? I don't know. What's the. Yeah, all the yeah. theoretically, all. So far, every talk of one has been taped through the goodwill of volunteers like I have here. And all of them shall. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Go play some indie games. <laughs>